Welcome back to the Means Report. Continuing our conversation with Georgia Senator David Perdue. And Senator Perdue, we talked about your concern about the growing deficit and how you and your colleagues will address it when you go back to work next week. Uh, how did you handle it in the business world as the head of Reebok, as the head of Dollar General? How did you deal with debt? Well, first of all, somebody introduced me in the budget, first budget committee as, as being a proponent of a, of a balanced budget. And I stopped him and I thanked him for the introduction. But I said, you know, in business, if I'd ever produced a balanced budget, I would have lost my job. You know, you use debt in business to leverage equity to make investment. Right. All right. You don't use it to just cover your losses and cover your expenses. And yet in the federal government, we don't have a balance sheet. We don't do normal budgeting the way most everybody else in the world does. And so it's a problem, and that's what's creating part of the problem in terms of this debt. Both sides are guilty, by the way, but to dig out of this, we need to, tr we need to treat this as a national emergency. I really believe with $20 trillion almost of debt and a pros prospect over the next 10 years that we'll add another $10 trillion of debt, this has gone too far. We've got to stop this now. Yeah, I'll go back to the kids again, and maybe it's as a father of a 13 and a 14 year old that this is on my brain, but it is, is it as simple as teaching them money management at a young age, a very young age, to avoid more of this, to avoid that next 10 trillion? Well, I think what we need to do is take 535 people in Congress and teach them money management. <laughs> yeah. You know, the kids seem to do okay. You seem to do okay. I do okay personally. Most businesses do okay personally. It's when people get in politics that they have a problem. There's a release valve that happens every year because the budget process is not working, hasn't worked since it was conceived in 74, and every year they have a release valve, and that release valve is more spending and more debt. Mm -hmm. Let me give you some examples. 35% of what we spent as a federal government in the last 10 years have been borrowed. That means that every dime we spend on our military, the mm -hmm. VA, and all domestic programs is borrowed. We simply cannot continue to do that. Let me ask you about your work on the Foreign Relations Committee, yeah. a committee that helps us when it comes to helping others, helping other countries deal with disasters, overcome poverty, improve things in their nations. Uh, you've mentioned the possibility of having public-private partnerships to help out with that. Explain that to us and tell me what kind of response you've gotten from companies. Well, I have to tell you, it's been a great response. I mean, this is what we do in business. I mean, I was head of several foundations when I ran these big companies. That's what companies do. We don't get much credit for it, but that's what we do, from human rights to education. What we have right now, we spend $34 billion in foreign aid in the federal government. Now, on a $3.8 trillion budget, that's not a lot. Not on a the lot. other hand, we're the most philanthropic country in the history of the world. Here's what's happening, though, to give you some encouragement. Power Africa took $8 billion of U.S. money. It added $40 billion of private money. And now we're powering a significant portion of Africa over the next five years. It's the most encouraging thing I've seen since I've been in government. Closer to home, what about Puerto Rico? You and Senator Isaacson split over an effort to help them. Puerto Rico is $72 billion in debt. You called it a Band-Aid. Can we bring in some private help here and help Puerto Rico? Well, I think the first thing Puerto Rico needs to do, and the reason I resisted that, is they're not using the assets they already have. Mm -hmm. They're not doing a real workout the way a corporation would if they got in a similar situation. They've got a big utility down there and so forth. But yes, I think there is some things, but not in a philanthropic point of view. I think this is one where they need to have investment to get the jobs back. I mean, they've had a brain leak in uh, Puerto Rico. A lot of people have left Puerto Rico because of the mismanagement of their government down there over the last few years. So you split with Isaacson on that one, but you came together with your fellow senator from Georgia on an effort to get more information about the $400 million payment to Iran, a payment that came while we were negotiating for the release of several prisoners there. Have you gotten any more answers? Well, we're getting them, yes. I, I can't talk about them today, but that letter that Johnny and I and others sent, four days later, Secretary Kerry comes out and says, oh, well, by the way, you know, it was related to the hostages. And my concern all along was, well, why weren't we getting those hostages out back when we were negotiating with Iran on the nuclear deal to start with? Right. Now, Senator Isaacson has been a great partner. He's the, I think he's the Howard Baker of our era up there. And he was very instrumental in, in getting this done. And I believe we're going to get more information that will come out uh, as we get uh, uh, the opportunity to release that in the next few days. You co-introduced the Saving Our Secrets Act. This SOS Act ensures that our private and sensitive and classified information stays that way. Your thoughts on that and, and uh, its chances for success? Well, I think it'll be successful because I think when people realize the danger that we're facing out there, we, we can't make all these secrets public. On the other hand, we have to find a way uh, to protect privacy in America as well. So that's a balance that we've got to have. I don't want to have a runaway federal government looking at everything we do. 
We have that right now in the CFPB, mm -hmm. uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We've got to rein that in. It's not under appropriation. It has no oversight from the federal government. So we, we've got to find that balance out there, but we got to also protect our secrets. Let me get you to touch on health care. We're seeing some of the insurance companies of late back away from these exchanges under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, might we see health care change or is uh, Obamacare locked and loaded forever? Well, no, I think it's collapsing under its own weight right now. I mean, deductibles are up over 67 percent in Georgia. The premiums are up dramatically. Insurance companies, even with all that, are dropping out. People are, are withdrawing their own uh, membership, and so people are not responding to the high deductible, high cost of this. And what I'm afraid of is that um, Hillary Clinton is going to be moving us more toward a single payer, which is what she talked about in 92 through 94 when we were talking about Hillary Care back then. And when these insurance companies can't make uh, a profit in here and survive, that's the only alternative left to the federal government, and that's what I'm afraid of. I don't want to let you leave without talking about our veterans. We have a lot of veterans in our audience, and we appreciate all of you. Anything that you can say to them that, that will help them in the future with any issues that a veteran might face? Well, the number one thing that we deal with in the state, I have a state office in Atlanta. Seventy percent of our constituent services is VA related. Wow. The VA is totally dysfunctional. Johnny Isaacson chairs that committee and is doing yeoman's work to try to change the tide of that. We spend $200 billion on the VA, and the services we get for our veterans is awful. The waiting times, the distances traveled, uh, all, the, all the bureaucratic headaches they have to go through to get approval. And by the way, most of these requests are not exotic requests. It's basic stuff just yep. to get their basic requirements and the things that they do. Look, I, I am so sensitive to this because if we're going to have a volunteer military, and I believe wholly in that, we have got to treat our veterans better than we are today. Senator Perdue, what about constituent services in general? When should people realize it's now time to call somebody as big and powerful as a senator? Are there other avenues you would recommend first with any constituent concerns before they reach out to you? Well, I think it's a great question. I mean, if, if they call us prematurely, we can direct them to the right people. So we're not worried about the calls. Uh, if people have a question, I tell them to go ahead and call us. That's what we're there for. We've got tremendous staff to do that. Uh, only a few people, but they're so good at that. They have the heart of a servant, and they're really doing a great job of trying to meet the needs of the people in Georgia. As a member of, and we're hitting as many issues as we can before we leave, as a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, you support changes in our food labeling. Yeah. Uh, can you give us any sort of feel, and maybe it's too early, uh, for what we might see on our food labels in the future as you try to streamline those? Well, what we... I don't normally like to have the federal government getting involved, but here's one where a state put a rule out that would have required people who were providing uh, food to have 50 different labels, and that was not, from a business perspective, acceptable. What we're trying again is to find the right balance to have people to have consumers have information about the products that they're buying, and that's what this was all about. You are the son of educators, God bless them. Uh, your father, a superintendent, in fact. Uh, what can we do at the federal level to empower our local systems to run their schools? The federal government needs to do less and less and less in education. Can we get rid of the Department of Education? Well, well here's the question. I mean, right now, we passed a bill last year that removed the federal mandate on Common Core. The media, the national media, didn't write much on that. That's a, that's a watershed event. We are moving billions of dollars back into state and local uh, authorities today. My mom would tell you if she were still alive, the best decision in education happened at the local level. Yeah. And so I think less and less intrusion by federal government is only going to produce better results. Look, let me give you one. We spend more money than most every other uh, country in the world on education, and yet the results are so abysmal. Our 14-year-olds are something like 25th and 26th in math and science around the world today. We know that bigger federal government involvement in education hasn't worked. I'd like to go back to what did work in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and that is more local control. My last question very quickly. Anything at the federal level you'd like to see done on gun control? We just finished an effort here in Augusta by the sheriff to get guns off the streets. Anything y'all can do? Well, the first thing, when you start messing around with the Second Amendment, you have to be very sober. Um, and, and this is one that I think you start with protecting the, the, what the founders had in mind. And, you know, when you get to the point where Second Amendment moves in, and then they start talking about the First Amendment, which they've been talking about, I get very nervous about that. So I do. think the Second Amendment is doing just fine. We already have limitations at the local level, which is where it should happen. It shouldn't happen at the federal level, in my opinion. 
thank you for taking the time to be here. We appreciate your leadership in Washington, Senator, and uh, I'm grateful to you. Well, no, thanks for the opportunity, Brad. Absolutely. Senator David Perdue, our guest on the Means Report today.